I'd like to tell you about a man named Ronald Reagan. He was president back in the 80s, and there was an incident where uh, he was shot in a terrible thing, and the, the country was mourning. And yet, did the entire government shut down? Uh, did the country collapse because one man went down? No. No, there, there's a whole... Uh, employees and workers and positions of authority all set up so that everything was okay and everything worked out. So although Reagan was uh, the nation's chief executive, his hospitalization had little impact on the nation's activity. Government continued on. On the other hand, uh, about a year ago in March, uh, the, the, uh, the garbage collectors went on strike in Paris. I don't know if you remember this. It didn't make a lot of news, but it was talked about. Uh, and the city soon found itself piled high with trash everywhere. There was just garbage everywhere. And so uh, it, it became a health hazard after three weeks. Um, it, it paralyzed the country. So you might ask yourself, who is more important, the, the president or a garbage collector? You know, in the body of Christ... As important as, as, you know, a pastor or a, or a missionary or a, or a prophet may be, uh, Paul reminds us, uh, the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are actually indispensable. That's what I've found. Many of you volunteer here at the court. Without you, things would simply not happen. So understand no matter what part you play, you matter uh, very much to the body of Christ. You can make a difference. Even a single child can make a difference in the body of Christ. Let's pray. God, thank you that you've made us not just as individuals, but as a unity, a group of believers working together to uh, serve those in need. God, help us to see ourselves as a part of a whole, <clears throat> and to really embrace that, God, we just pray, God, that you would speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. The Apostle Paul challenges us, just as he challenged uh, the church in Ephesus. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 16. And he challenged that church at that time in history, a very important church, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling they'd received. He wrote to them saying, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. So it talks about this calling. And normally when we think of a calling, we think of someone called to the ministry or someone called to this particular duty or job. But Here's the, it's an important thing to understand. All of you have been called. Called to Christ. Called to salvation. Called out of the world into a new way. And in response to that, as Christians, we want to live the most pure and blameless life in a wicked world. To be love in a time of coldness. To speak truth when there's so many lies in the world. To care about others when most only care about themselves. The calling is high to Jesus. Paul tells us to live our lives in a way that matches the heights of what we've been called to. And we're immediately instructed on what that looks like. We're, we're, we're building a house today. You're the house that God is building. And it's something he is doing in you. It is not something you are necessarily doing in yourself, though you have a part to play in that, whether it's obedience, whether it's loving others, there is a part for you to play, all empowered, though, by the Holy Spirit. It says then, so here's our structure. You can see my artwork is a little lacking, but that's okay. In verses 2 and 3, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity 
of the spirit in the bond of peace. Okay, now this is not new to us, is it? We've seen in numerous other structures we've built, certain things appear that are going to keep appearing to us as characteristics of a true biblical Christian. Humility is constantly mentioned by Paul, by Peter, by Jesus himself, everywhere, Old Testament, New Testament. Humility, gentleness, patience, what are these? Fruits of the Spirit, that's right. Wow, y'all y'all got that pretty quick, guys. Okay. Fruits of the Spirit, aren't they? These are fruits that are emblematic of a Christian. A, a true Christian will begin to exemplify humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, right? That's, that's, we talked about that, making allowance for each other's faults. And there's faults in this room, believe me, I, I've got some of them myself. So yeah, there are faults in this room that we got to bear up with and make room for. Unity is one that we're going to see uh, is going to play a center position in this structure. And through the bonds of peace, it also says. So it gives this picture almost like if you were to say these are bricks being formed, uh, the peace, it, it could be a brick, but it it's also appears to be almost the glue that holds the bricks together. Is peace, this peace from God. It says, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Bond of peace. Almost like this bonding agent that holds it together. Okay? So, First, we're told to live worthy of our calling. And then Paul says, here's what it looks like. Humility, gentleness, patience, all these things. We've talked about them a lot, so I don't want to belabor it too much. But obviously, humility is thinking highly of others and thinking of ourselves soberly. Gentleness is not being too loud, not being too intense, not being too overbearing, not being too abrupt, right? Intense. I'm going to be gentle. Have a, have, a, have a mindset of gentleness. I, I, I remember there was a, I, I went out to eat once and there was this waiter. He just had this gentle affect, right? He just stood there very gently and he just made you feel very, very comfortable. Kind of stood almost like in a way of just kind of welcoming you. And just, he had this peace about him and this gentleness. You, you, you all know gentleness when you see it, I think. Patience is being good at waiting. Are you good at waiting? Okay. What, what about in traffic? Are you, are you still good at waiting now? <laughs> See, I, I, I was thinking about that. I, man, I'm, I'm, I'm learning patience, and I thought about when I'm driving. Wait, oh, uh-oh. Not as patient as I thought. Uh, bearing with one another is making room for people's faults. Unity. Unity among believers is so hugely important, you guys. Unity, no divisions, complete unity, not partial unity, but total unity it talks about. Okay, and we'll get into that more. Uh, it says next in Ephesians uh, 4, 4 through 6, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. He's, he's trying to point us to the oneness of everything in the Christian faith. There is one body, one spirit. You are called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. So we see a sense of complete unity is God's design. Does the church have that right now in the world? Not particularly. We're trying. We're working on it. We want unity. That unity is what is how God designed us. So again, unity. All of these characteristics, I think, build unity. Humility builds unity. Gentleness builds unity. Patience builds unity. Bearing in love builds unity. Peace builds unity. All these things build toward a united church. A church that works as one. I have to think about churches that have split. Churches where a divide forms. 
remember many years ago, I was part of a church where one set of family sat on one side, the other set of family sat on the other, and there was just sort of a, they kind of had, a, had an agreement, like, well, we're both here, you know, but then there wasn't a lot of love, right? There were not a lot of bonds between the groups. It's like one side really didn't like the other side, but they kind of agreed to sit together, you know, as long as they're on opposite sides. That's not what we want. We want a united body, united in Christ. Next, Paul turns back uh, to individual believers again, and he says, uh, But grace was given to each one of you according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. And it continues. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth? Who He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he may fill all things. In other words, the foundation of this whole structure is Christ's gift. Of grace. That is the foundation of what we build on in our Christian life. If we don't have this foundation, we will be building on sand that will crumble and the whole structure will break into nothing. It has to have a foundation in the real Jesus, the true biblical Jesus, knowing him personally as Savior. That, that has to be the foundation of our house. Any other foundation will fail. It says Christ gave us gifts. And I know that means his grace, right? The gift of salvation. But I think it also means spiritual gifts here. So it talks about he, he led people out of captivity and gave them gifts. You, you see different, different spiritual gifts in the scriptures, like faith, showing mercy, prophecy, giving, administration, shepherding, and on and on the list goes. And I want you to be thinking about what is the particular gift that God has gifted me with that I can use for the body of Christ to serve my brothers and sisters? What is my gifting? So keep that in mind as we continue to build our structure. Because not every house is the same, right? Some houses have a French style. Some houses have a more urban style. Some houses have more of a ranch style. Some houses are shaped in a certain way. So your house is going to be a little different than someone else's. And what I see that is as your giftings are, are, that kind of is the structure of your house is going to be a little different based on your gifting. Like Bruce is very good with construction, with building. That's his gifting, right? He, he's, he, he, he got that from God to use, to bless others, to bless people, to do work in the world. You know, Danny, it may be speaking, you know, speaking the truth, giving his testimony with bread. It's serving. He's he's a he has a servant heart to want to give, to want to help with something, to, to carry boxes, to to to, to uh, mow someone's lawn. It, that, that's a gift of service. What is your gift? And that's going to be that's going to distinguish your house uh, from all the others. And we're all a little different right? in the body of Christ. We're all a little different. And it is and that's intentional. We're all meant to fit together as puzzle pieces to, to, to be a diverse and uh, unique body of believers that's able to serve in different ways. So not only then, we see this, okay, Christ is the foundation. We're part of one body of Christ. Not only then, though, did Jesus give uh, spiritual gifts, salvation. It says he also gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. So this is another gift that Christ has given the body of Christ, his body on earth. He has given us leaders and teachers, shepherds, evangelists, prophets, people to minister to us as we're building our house in Christ. Okay, so you see uh, the structure being built, Christ is the builder, you're cooperating with him, 
But then you also see, we see the five-fold ministry is what we call this, is ministering to each Christian, helping them in that process of building their house, which is uh, growth in Christ. Okay? So I, do, I, I want to talk a little bit about, about the five-fold, because I want you to uh, consider, uh, do I know certain people who fit these descriptions and I want you to let them minister to you, you know. Obviously, I'm, I'm, I, I'm one of these five as well. But there should, should be others in your life as well who you're allowing to minister to you. That are other parts of the fivefold. So, let's talk about apostles. An apostle, the, the word means one who is sent. A messenger, Okay. So I think of an apostle as like a pioneer. They, they are church planters, missionary types. They blaze new trails. They try new things, and they build up the church that way, like the apostle Paul. He was, a, he was on missionary journeys planting churches, right? Prophets. Prophets speak a hard truth. They may speak a word to you, something meant just for you. I had that happen once with me where a prophet sent me a message on the last day of a fast I was doing. And this prophet was obeying God and sending me this message as a conclusion to my fast. And I was like, wow, that is a legitimate prophet, isn't it? Wow, okay. So, they speak a word. They call us away from sin. The, the prophetic gifting is also very much, get out of your sins, repent, for God's judgment is coming. It's, that's that kind of Old Testament prophet role. They mourn the evils of the world, right? Like Jeremiah, the, the weeping prophet, mourning the evils of the world. The evangelists, the evangelists, I'm sure many of you, before you got here to church, joining the body of Christ, you encountered evangelists out there who ministered to you in different ways. Destiny has a gifting for evangelism. It's also a spiritual gift. It's not just a fivefold. There is a gifting for evangelism as well where people have, have a strong sense, I need to minister to others outside the body of Christ. So many of you have encountered evangelists. They are street ministers, people on Facebook who are blasting out the truth, uh, people on street corners, people handing out tracts, uh, people uh, doing live streams. You know, a lot of these are evangelists who are trying to get that word out there in unique ways, bloggers. I mean, just uh, people at events who are speaking, you know, uh, uh, Christian apologists on college campuses are speaking. They are evangelists. Then you have shepherds. Shepherds are pastors. They minister to you in that way. I think it can also be like a counselor, like a Christian counselor, someone you go to for counsel, a shepherd. A shepherd is like someone who has a flock around them, right? And they're, they're helping kind of lead that flock with their shepherd staff toward heaven. Obviously, Jesus is the chief shepherd. That this shepherd, lowercase s, is a, a steward, right? Shepherding his flock toward, toward heaven. And then, of course, teachers. Teachers are experts in the Bible. They, 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 are, they lead Bible studies. They, they, they teach at seminaries, right? They are professors. They, they, are, they, they are talented at dissecting and, and uh, revealing the word of God to people. So these are the fivefold ministry that God has called to serve the church. And uh, as individual Christians, try to come under uh, the teaching of, of these various uh, authorities in the body of Christ, these various influencers, because they're all going to have uh, the word from a slightly different angle, and it's going to be wonderful. One of the greatest things we can just go on YouTube, you know, go online and, and find, you know, someone to listen to that we know is biblical and, and sit under their teaching as well. As long as we're discerning about what we're hearing. There are false teachers out there as well. So you see the fivefold. There's also a fivefold of false teachers too, just so you know. So there can be a false apostle. There can be a false prophet. There can be a false shepherd. There can be a false teacher. There can be a false evangelist. So watch out for that as well. There's ravenous wolves out there. Be careful. So all of these are meant to build us up. And I have been, I can look back, and I'm sure you can look back at people that ministered to you and helped put a critical brick in place in your house, right? Where you're like, oh, I needed that truth they just spoke to me. 
whoa, they spoke a word over you like that prophet who spoke to me. Or they taught you something, a teacher taught you something. It's very important. So thank God for the fivefold. Okay, let's continue though. Next in verse 13, this is the goal right here. If you want to look at the, the goal of this portion of scripture, it's this. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. This is the goal. The end goal is that in your walk with Jesus over the years, you would reach a place of maturity. Maturity. Christian maturity. Reaching a place where you are mature. You're no longer a child tossed to and fro, but you've found a place of maturity. So we see two more bricks going into place, the knowledge of Jesus and the unity of the faith. Again, so unity to unity of the faith. Knowledge of Jesus. So as we study the word here at church and as you study on your own, the goal is that you would grow and grow and grow in the knowledge of Jesus. And there's so much to know about Jesus. There's so much. So much. And that you would find a place of the unity of the faith where you feel truly deeply connected with other believers in the faith. It's not just a general sense of unity, but it's a unity with the believers that's deep. Where you say, these, these people in my church, I feel closer to them than my own family. They are my brothers and sisters. I love them. I would die for them. Are you there yet? <laughs> if you're not, that's okay. You'll get there. But I, you know, everywhere I've gone in the Salvation Army, I find a family I didn't even know. That's what's amazing. So we're, we see the house coming together. So that, in verse 14, what, what, why do we want to come into the fullness of Christ? So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. So the contrast is between a child who's kind of tossed to and fro, doesn't know what to believe, goes here, goes there, to being a mature adult, you could say. And I think over the years of be being a Christian, you slowly kind of grow up. First you're a, a little baby, then you're a toddler, then you grow up, you, you, you're a tween, then you're a teen, then you're maybe in your late teens, early 20s, where you're starting to get it, but you're still kind of stupid. <laughs> and then you're in your mid-20s, and you think you're smart, but you're actually still stupid. I remember that for myself. Uh, thinking, oh, I'm 25 now, I know everything. Not so much. Uh, I only think I do, right? And then when you, when you hit 29, 30, and you're like, man, I really have no idea what I'm doing, but that's okay, because God's good. Uh, <laughs> And you eventually, I think, reach a place where you have it, you do have a sense, like, you become a mature Christian. And I recall uh, when I was in my first maybe two, three years of being a Christian, I really was. I was tossed to and fro, you guys. I was all over the place. Um, I was listening to prosperity preachers like Joel Osteen. Um, I, I was listening to Calvinists online. I was... I was talking and meeting with Jehovah Witnesses, and my grandpa was like getting worried, and I, I'm all, I was all over the place. I'm taking a Christian basics course online from who knows what institute. Apparently, I just found it online, and I'm just going to take this, whatever. And I was just, I was all over the place. Uh, and but slowly, I started to find a maturity, and I think in that, what we find is a few things: we find stability, and we find discernment. And those things lead to maturity. Uh, stability means we, 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 we're, we're, we're not tossed to and fro anymore. We have, we're stable. We know the scriptures ourselves, right? We're not plugged into prosperity preachers or TV evangelists. Or I'm not saying they're all bad. That's not what I'm saying. But we're, we're, we find a stability. And we find a discernment to be able to, to listen to something and say that there's, there's something off there. Or listen to something and say that's not, that's, that's way off. <laughs> you know? 
And in all that, I think we do find maturity. We aren't thrown back and forth anymore. We aren't torn in different directions. We have a stability from knowing God's word. We're able to test what is true and what is false. Lastly, in verses 15 and 16, rather, so rather than this being tossed to and fro, rather than that, being deceived by human cunning and deceit, rather than that, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So I, I, let's not try to digest all that. Stick with verse 15, the top there. Speaking the truth in love. Let's talk about that first. Speaking the truth in love is, is a balance I've found that is super important in the body of Christ because it implies a level of maturity that Paul is talking about here. This is the maturity, speaking the truth in love. And why? I'll, let, let me, here's what God kind of showed me. I've seen unstable Christians before, and they usually fall into one of two camps. The first is those who speak the truth without love. Hey, you gotta, you got to believe this, man. What's wrong with you? They're, they're yelling at you. They're, they're pushy. There's no love in the gospel they're giving you. Or, and I, listen, good Christians can end up here, so let's not condemn them either. They've gotten, they've gotten so used to fighting back the world, which is trying to encroach in the church every day. They're trying to push their beliefs on us as Christians every stinking day. I get it. It makes Christians mad because they're trying to defend the barriers of what the Bible says. That's a good instinct, it is, but I think we, get, we can get so used to fighting back the world's ideologies from invading the church that we start to fight back without love. We can speak the truth with love. We can. And I get it, it's hard. Christians are, are barraged on every side by the culture. Television, news media, it's all so secular. It all pushes its agenda on the church. And some churches cave, right? So you have these men and women trying to defend the barriers of truth, not keep people out, but defend truth, right? Like, no, uh, this is what the Bible says. Like, it's true that God's word is true. It's a good instinct. We have to do it with love. Because we can't fight fire with fire, can we? We have to overcome evil with good. So that's one camp where we, we, we end up speaking the truth without love. And then the other camp is they speak love without truth. <laughs> so you see this where they're so focused on being nice, on being kind, that they, they simply affirm whatever you say. I mean, I think I'm a purple zebra. I affirm you in that. Wow, I'm, look at how loving I am. I affirm you in that. Yeah, but you're not a purple zebra. That's, you know, that's, it's truth, right? And so we have to find, they don't speak truth. They compromise God's word in the end because they're so focused on being kind, being loving, uh, promoting justice that they, they, lose love, they, they lose truth and it's only love, right? It's not really love then though. It's a perverted form of love that's just niceness, right? And there's no truth in it. They just want everyone to feel great, feel accepted, feel good. That's a good instinct, though, right? That is a good instinct to want people to feel loved, to feel accepted, to feel uh, like they're, they're welcome and stuff. But we do have to keep up truth as well. We can't knock truth over to, for the sake of being, quote, unquote, loving either. So you see this balance to speak the truth in love, it's sometimes repeated Love the sinner, hate the sin, right? You strike this balance of loving the person while calling them away from the sin they're in. And you see how we can mess that up. We call them out of their sin without loving them. That's not helpful. Or we, we love them and say, just stay in your sin. It's okay. God, 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 God says that's fine. And that's, that's not helpful either, is it? So we have to find this balance of speaking the truth in love. That I th and I think Paul states that right here because that is a hallmark of a mature Christian. 
And all that, it goes back to verse 13, to reach the stature of the fullness of Jesus Christ. So coming into a place of maturity where we are speaking the truth in love is going to be an evidence that, you know, we've, our structure is built up. And then in all of that, to reach a place where we are, we have found spiritual fullness in Jesus Christ. What that means is to be truly filled with Jesus. That's what that means. I mean, totally surrendered to Jesus in fullness. That's what that means. That's not saying you've, you've built yourself up by your own power to be just as great as Jesus. That's not what that means. What it means is you are totally surrendered and yielded to Jesus' control over your life. Okay. By this picture of a house full and mature in Christ is a single believer. This is you, right? The structure is you, mature in Christ, yielded to Christ, walking in Christ. But to conclude today, all of this is to fit into a larger structure. Does one house sit by itself? Not, not, not normally. Uh, it sits with many other homes. Or if you think of it like a brick, it's a brick that fits into a much larger structure. We all have our part to play in the body of Christ. And when the body functions correctly, Paul writes, then it builds itself up in love constantly building itself up in love. That's where you see revivals break out. That's where you see the church growing by leaps and bounds. That's where you see the Billy Graham uh, revivals and crusades of the 1970s and 1980s. That's where you see the Asbury revival. That's where you see the church growing and blossoming and spreading everywhere is where the believers look like this. They are yielded to Christ, mature in Christ, they are also fitting together as one body, and then they are spreading out where the gospel everywhere. You can think of it like a brick wall, or you can think of it like a gathering of houses. Maybe I like that a little better. Like a city, you might say. And each house represents a person in the city who serves some function to make the city function. Whether it's a teacher, a painter, an electrician. Think about our city, Owasso. It needs painters, teachers, electricians, clerks, drivers, musicians, artists, plumbers, jewelers, construction workers, daycare workers, waitresses, politicians, lawyers, pastors, and so on. We each have a particular part to play then similarly in the body of Christ, each a unique role to fulfill. It all fits together. We all have a particular role to fulfill in the body of Christ. We all have something we can do in the body. And I don't like this picture uh, entirely. I kind of like it, but it's not the building. I mean, that's just not what it is, but I like this picture of people with different talents kind of all contributing, but it is, it is the people that is the church, right? Amen. It all fits together. And if each member is serving with their gifts, so that's you, think about what is my gift? How can I contribute it to the body of Christ? What is your gift? Think about that because the, the body needs your gift. The body really needs your gift. You are vital. It all fits together. And if each person is using their gifts, the body works well and grows and prospers. If they do not work well together, if they're fighting each other, the body doesn't grow properly. So for each of us today, we should make it our goal to walk in this way, spiritual fullness in Jesus Christ, and then we are going to be very effective members of the body of Christ, using our gifts and talents to spread his word everywhere in love. So let's review. Number one, we remember we want to live up to our call. And that's growth in Christ, I think, is what that picture is. Number two, we want to grow in those ways that Paul told us. Humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, unity, and the bonds of peace. Number three, our foundation is, of course, the gift of Christ's grace. Jesus is our foundation, his gift. Any other foundation will be sinking sand. Number four, 
Christ has also given us spiritual gifts to use to help each other. Remember, each of us have a gift. Number five, Christ also gave us the five-fold ministry to build us up. Now, I'm always seeking out the five-fold. I'm looking for teachers who have that gift, the prophets who have that gift, and to learn from them. Then we want to grow in the knowledge of Jesus and in the unity of the faith. Then we will find stability and discernment to avoid false doctrines. Speaking the truth in love, we avoid missing either love or truth in that equation. We, we speak truth in love. And all of this will lead us to spiritual fullness in Christ, maturity, being fully surrendered to Jesus' leading. And number 10, in that place of maturity in Christ, we can serve our place in the body of Christ faithfully and successfully. So remember, brothers and sisters, you have a part to play in the family of believers if you're here today, I believe God has called you uniquely to play a part in the Salvation Army's work in the body of Christ. Salvation Army has our little corner of the body of Christ. We believe we're part of a bigger whole, but we are part of that body of Christ. And we serve alongside Christians everywhere in the world in different ways. I have this one of my favorite uh, paintings that kind of displays, you kind of look at it, you see this different members of the body of Christ who are part of the Salvation Army serving in different ways in different parts of the world. It's very inspiring to me. Um, remember, you're called to this kind of unity where we're all one with all Christians everywhere. <clears throat> you can make a difference, friends. You have a role to play in this body. Remember the beginning of the sermon. You don't have to be Ronald Reagan, President of the United States, in order to make a big difference. You can be a trash collector. You can be a servant heart who, who helps people, you know, fix their, you know, furnace or whatever. You can be, you know, someone who prays with someone and it makes a big difference. It really does. So grow into Christ's fullness and you are going to be an effective hero on the front lines of the Salvation War. Let's pray. Lord, Thank you so much. Thank you, God, uh, for this time. God, as we go into our response time, Father, we just uh, pray as Brett leads us in a closing song. God, that during that song, uh, we would uh, turn ourselves over to you afresh, God, fully surrender to you again, Jesus. Uh, come into fullness of you, Lord Jesus. Let you rule and reign in us, God. We surrender to your leading, Jesus, afresh right now. Lead us, rule us, reign in us, Jesus. Bring us into maturity, Lord Jesus. That doesn't make us better than anyone else, God, no. Because we're humble. We're servants, God. Because you've called us to humbly serve. We've only done our duty, God. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.